very simple mistakes on syntax <laughs> you and and you don't worry about that because you you, s you can still get partial marks because uh, because we are the tutors are manually marking your assignment so you don't worry about that and but please make sure that you you can pass the auto test to eliminate those uh, syntax errors and And all right, uh, let's start. So m before we jump into the main content today, uh, let me quickly go through the the additional slides I have provided. Uh, because in la in our last lecture, we have we have learned about the functional dependencies, and some students may wonder, okay, what is the usage of functional dependency? Why it is important? And actually, it it could be used for uh, it could be used in a lot of scenarios uh, in DBMS, in the design of uh, the database. Uh, however, there are three key points here. The first one is it is very useful to determine keys because it can, it can help us to generate uh, which our attributes could determine the value of other attributes. And this is quite natural for key. And the second one is it can help us to normalize the database and it to reduce to reduce or remove redundancy. And I have shown an example in this in the slides here, uh, a, a, a very a very basic example here to show you how it could be used to remove redundancy. And the last one is uh, it is very useful for uh, for uh, for creating integrity constraints and uh, and 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 this is just a quick uh, example of how it could be used and it's just a summary and we will be learning how to systematically use functional dependencies today so that's so this is this additional slide is like a bridging is like a bridge between our previous slide about functional pr dependencies and today's content. So let's jump into today's slide. So first, uh, so this is today's outline. We will go through some announcements. We will have a quick recap of what we have learned uh, in our last lecture, and we will learn three important concepts closures, normal forms, and normalization. And the first announcement is uh, about quiz five. Uh, the due date is on this Friday uh, tomorrow, so please just do it. And the second one is about the provisional marks for assignment one. It is available now, and please let us know if there's any issues. Uh, like you have make made some syntax errors, you have uh, you 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 think you have uh, maybe your 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 queries are have failed to be loaded into the database, and those will give you zero marks for for auto tests. But but we do have a second round of manual uh, checking for your assignment, so you can still get partial marks. And but please let us know if there's any issues with your provisional mark now. And the third announcement is about assignment two, and we are still working on it. And I'm trying, I'm pushing Dylan for creating the specifications now. Uh, and but but he's very kind of busy with uh, uh, the marking of assignment one. But uh, we will release. And the the expected due date is week ten Friday now, and we will release the official notice through Web CMS, and but we we may need to further de defer it if we can't finish the the the, the current tasks uh, on our hand, and and there are two other things you need to you need to take care of. So first, if you have some special considerations requests you should submit to the portal earlier because I I just received some approvals from the school for assignment one yesterday. So 
So to avoid getting late penalties, if you have special considerations, you should submit your request earlier. And because it takes time for the admin to to approve your requests. And the second one is mm, for ELP extension request, you can directly send us emails. And it should be sent 24 hours before the due date. And that's uh, about the special considerations and the ELP students. And you don't worry uh, because we are kind of uh, releasing assignment two a bit late, but you don't worry, you don't need to worry about your uh, final exam preparation getting affected by assignment two because it will have much less, uh, much fewer questions. It won't take you too long to finish. So that's about uh, assignment two. And the, the, th the first uh, announcement is that for the help session um, conflicting with today's lecture, it is finally officially shifted to the morning session. But next week, but that's our last physical lecture because I will be attending a conference on week 10. So that session, that help session is, help is hosted by Kenneth, and he's a very helpful, nice, and experienced tutor. So if you have any questions with your assignments, with your tutorials, with whatever questions, you can come to the help session, and, and our tutor is ready to help you. So that's about announcement four. And we can come to the knowledge learning part. So let's have a quick recap of what we have learned in our last lecture. So the first concept we have learned is uh, redundancy of database. So redundancy, so if, if the database is not well designed, we could suffer from redundancies. And redundancies could cause different types of ano anomalies. And there are three types of anom anomalies. So can you quickly think about them? So what are the three types of anomalies? Update, insert, and delete. Yes, yes. And and we have we do have some measurements to to counter this kind of anom anomalies to deal with them. So the first one is we can insert a lot of triggers, but that is not ideal because if we insert too many triggers into the database, it will slow down the execution of the entire system. So that's why we don't want to use twi uh, triggers to solve or to resolve these anomalies. And instead, we want to remove the redundancies from the design of the database. So we, we, it, it is more like a pro proactive way of dealing with these redundancies. And the second key concept we have learned in our last lecture is functional dependencies. So can you still remember the definition of functional dependency? Yes, yes, yes. So it, it is like it is like one it's not one attribute, it's a set of attributes can determine another set of attributes. So if the value of a set of attributes is settled or is fixed, then the the, the rest the, the other the determ the, the depend the determined set of attributes is also fixed. So let's say if I, uh, if X determines uh, determines Y, or Y is dependent on X, then if X is fixed, uh, Y is also determined. So that's the definition here. And we have also learned six inference rules to de derive new uh, functional dependencies based on existing ones. So do you still remember the six inference rules? 
Yes, transitivity. That. Uh, excuse me. Augmentation. Yes. What else do we have? Actually, it's hard <laughs> to remember all of them, but but you have to. So the first one is reflexive re reflexivity. So uh, it's very trivial. So it's like a set of attributes can, of course, determine itself. And the second one is augmentation. So we can add the same set of attributes on both sides of the de 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 uh, functional dependencies. And the third one is transitivity. So we can, I it is like uh, bigger than or smaller than. So we can, we can combine different um, different functional dependencies together. And the third, uh, the first one is additivity. So we can we can combine multiple functional dependencies uh, according to the right hand side of uh, according to the left hand side of the uh, the dependency. And there's also projectivity. Uh, which is to separate one separate one composite uh, uh, functional dependency into several uh, independent ones, and the, th the last one is called pseudo transitivity because it could be derived from transitivity. So remember, in our last lecture, the last example, we showed you how to derive pseudo transitivity based on transitivity. So if you if you forgot that you can take take a look at our uh, the last slide in our last lecture. And that's all about what we have learned and uh, in our last lecture. And now we are going to have a have a systematic look at how to use functional dependencies. Why are they useful? So the first, before we use, before we could use functional dependencies for normalization for determining keys, let's learn another key concept here, which is called closure. So, so the the, def the definition here is, given a set f of functional dependencies, how many new functional dependencies can we derive? So that's. That's that's actually a question because we we can use um, different inference rules to generate or to create new functional dependencies. But what is but but in the end, how many of them can we derive? So in order to so actually for a finite set of attributes, there must also be a finite set of derivable functional dependencies, and and in order to describe this this thing here, we introduce the concept of closure. So closure means the largest collection of dependencies that can be derived from a given set of functional dependencies. So it is called the closure of that set of functional dependencies. So this is the definition of closure. And closure, closures allow us to answer two very interesting questions. So the first one is, is a particular dependency x to x determines y derivable from a functional, uh, a set of functional dependencies f? So if it is within that closure, of course, it's derivable, right? And are two set of dependencies i find g equivalent so because because if their closures are equivalent then the two sets of uh, dependencies are uh, essentially equivalent so this is um, this is uh, the the answers to the first two questions so uh, if we want to determine is if a functional dependency is derivable from a set of functional dependencies. We can we can compute the closure of that set of functional dependencies and check whether the uh, the functional dependency belongs to the closure or not. 
And if we want to check if two uh, set of functional dependencies are equivalent, we should check the equivalence of their of their closures. So that's the the answers how we answer these two questions. And but but closures for functional dependencies could be very very large. For example, we have uh, we have this relation with three attributes, uh, A, B, and C, and we have two uh, functional dependencies in our uh, in our set here, and and you can can you imagine how big the the closure is. Actually, it is very very big. So so this we only. We can we can derive so many because we have six different inference different inference rules, and we can apply them recursively on the on the newly derived rules, uh, functional dependencies. So in the end, the closure can be very very large. Even for this simple example here, we can we can have a lot we can have a very large closure. So so. If we really want to answer that two questions, it is infeasible or it is not very practical to use uh, the, the closures of functional dependencies. So, so to solve this problem, we use closures based on set of attributes rather than sets of functional dependencies. So what is uh, so what's the definition of uh, closures for a set of attributes? So the, def the definition here is given given a set X of attributes and a set F of functional dependencies, the closure of X denoted as X plus is the largest set of attributes that can be derived from x using f. So, for example, here, for, for x, if we want to, if we want to, uh, if we want to calculate the closure of x for this, for these two given functional dependencies, it's kind of straightforward because x can determine y and z. So we also put y and z into the closure of x. So we collect all the all the set of attributes that could be determined by the initial set of attributes. And that is called the closure of a set of attributes. So this is the concept here, and for for uh, for computation, of course, it is it of course the the, the double this this uh, absolute value here means the the means the size of the set. So the size of the closure actually is bounded by the size uh, the, the the number of attributes because it could be. Uh, it could it could not exceed uh, the number of uh, all attributes. It's very clear, and uh, and here's a pseudocode for computing attribute closure. So that is uh, this is so in plain text, it is to it is to add all the all the attributes that could be determined by this initial set of attributes according to the given set of functional dependencies. So this is how it is explained in plain text. We collect all the attributes that could be determined by the initial set of attributes according to the functional dependencies. So that's how we calculate closures uh, for set of attributes. So so this is so now let's come back to the two questions before so for the first question is 
a functional dependency derivable from a set of functional dependencies. So how can we answer this with uh, the set, uh, the closure of attributes? So this is how we calculate it. So we calculate the closure of the closure of the set of attributes on the left hand left hand side and check whether the the the, the, the attributes of the on the right hand side belongs to the closure of the set of attributes on the left hand side. So if it is if if y belongs to uh, the closure of x in this case, then this this functional dependency is derivable from from the, the existing functional dependencies. So this is the answer to the first question. So the second one is how should how could we check if two sets of functional dependencies are essentially equivalent. So we we need to take three steps. So the first one is for each dependency in G we check whether it is this dependency is derivable from F. And for each dependency in F, we check whether it is derivable from G. And if it is true for both of the pre two previous steps, it, it implies that the, the closures of the two sets of functional dependencies are equivalent. And therefore, the two sets of functional dependencies are equivalent. So, so actually, you can see here the second, the answering of the second question determ uh, uh, depends on um, the answer of the first question. So we need to check for every dependency whether it is derivable from the other set of functional dependencies. So this is how we solve the second problem. So we can we can we can use. Uh, we can use an example here to to demonstrate this process. So let's consider a database for a sing simple online bookstore with the following attributes. So we have um, B for book ID. We have these five attributes. We have B for book ID. We have T for title, A for author, P for publisher, and Y for year. So let's try to answer, are these two sets of functional dependencies equal to each other or not? So let's try to answer this question. Uh, of course, this, this is kind of obvious, but, but let's try to solve it step by step with what we have learned just now. So remember, we have three steps. So for the first step is for each, so we check for each dependency in one set of functional dependencies if it is derivable from the other set of attributes. And we do this twice for both of the functional dependencies and see if they are equal to each other or not. So uh, if, it, if, if it is true for all of the dependencies or not, so let's try to Look into the dependencies in function in 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 function one. So for B, what is the closure for the set of attributes B here in set one? Yeah, it's actually. But actually, you, you, need, you also need to include B itself because because of the reflexivity. So it could determine it itself. So B for B, the closure is B T A P Y, and what about T A? So what's 
Yeah, T A B. Actually, so, sorry, I just I just put everything here. So w what is what is the uh, what is the closure for P Y? P Y T. Yes, it's quite obvious. And for site two, what is the what is the closure for B this time? Yes, actually, it's also B T A P Y because because we can because T A P Y and B itself are all determined by B, so it it's also this B T A P Y. And what about T A? It's actually the same because these two rules are the same across these two set of uh, th these two dependencies are the same across these two set of functional dependencies. So now it is already very, very obvious that these two sets are equal to each other. Actually if we, we, we if we want to follow the if we want to follow the steps here we need to check for every we need to check for every uh, dependency here uh, in, in one side if it uh, if it uh, belongs to, if it is derivable from the other side using the uh, using the closures of the of the attributes, and you may wonder what is the usage of closures. Actually, it is used for It is useful for determining keys. So the question here is what are the keys of a relation implied by the set of functional dependencies? So the, the answer here is we, we should find s subsets of subsets K belonging to belonging to the R R is a set of attributes uh, the, uh, made up uh, in making up the relation here. So such that the closure of this key, this K here, equals to the entire the all the attributes from the relation. So if the closure of of a subset equals to the in all the attributes from the relation, it could be used as a candidate key. So that's how it works. And let's have a look at this example here. So let's try to determine the primary keys for each one of the, m remember we, we are determining act actually determining the candidate key. There could be more than one key here for each one of the, uh, the relations. So the first one is we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We have seven attributes in our relation and the functional dependency is like this. So can you come up with the key here? A, C, and E. So let's think step by step. So actually all the dependencies should be coming from the left-hand side because keys should determine the rest of the values. So let's think step by step. A, is A a key here? No, right? Because the closure of A is A, B. So it is not a key. What about AC? Also no, right? What about ACE? The answer? Yes. Because the closure of ACE equals to can, can equals to R, equals to the entire set of attributes of the relation. So that's why. So we, we, we should always try to 
grab the keys from the right uh, left hand side of the functional dependencies and we can think step by step and try to uh, go through all the possibilities and the second one here is we have four we have four attributes a b c and d so what is the key here in this case yes yes it's very straightforward the, the key is a because the closure of a sorry because the closure of a is equal to the entire set of attributes now let's come to the third so we have three attributes uh, a b and c and we have three functional dependencies so what's the key here in this case yes 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 we have three candidate keys here because all of them their closures equal to r because this is like a this is like a a, a, loo a, a looped uh, dependencies so all of them could be used as a key here and talking about closures we we it is related to another important concept called minimal covers so for a given application we can we can or a given scenario we can have many different sets of functional dependencies all are equivalent they, they could have the same closure but they are e essentially equivalent and but they they could look differently they could they could have different functional dependencies but they they can share the same closure so the question here is which one is the best to model this scenario or application so we have so many choices of functional dependencies and which one should we choose here to model this scenario or application so what we want is the the model should be complete so that that set of functional dependencies should be complete and it although it should be complete it should be as small as possible because because we we may want to use them to check the validity of the database later after updates and the less tracking is always better so the 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 set should be complete and it should be as small as possible so can we derive the smallest complete set of functional dependencies and that is and that is th and that requires us to calculate minimal covers so the definition of minimal covers is like this so for a set of for a set of functional dependencies the minimal cover denoted as fc is like this so fc is equivalent to f so it is complete so this ensures that it is complete and the second property here is all the function all the functional dependencies having the f should have the form of x of the, the 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 right hand side should be a single attribute so this is called a canonical uh, canonical functional dependency and the last the last uh, uh, the last uh, uh, property here is it is not possible to make fc smaller without without breaking the equivalence of the first property 
So we, we can't delete any functional dependencies from FC, from the minimal cover. And we can't delete any attributes from one of the functional dependencies within the minimal cover. So this ensures it is the smallest. So the first property ensures it is complete. The last property ensures that it is it is um, it is the smallest. So so uh, a functional a functional dependency is redundant if we rem if we remove that functional dependency and the 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 the, requ the if we remove that functional dependency, the new set of functional dependencies is still equivalent to the previous one. Then this functional dependency is redundant here in this minimal cover. So this is the first key the thing to take note. And the second thing about attribute is an attribute is called redundant if, if we remove that uh, if we if we replace the the functional dependencies involving that attribute with the functional dependencies without that attribute the 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 set of all functional dependencies are still equivalent to the previous to the original set of functional attributes so this, these two, these, these, these are the two rules for calcul for de this determining whether whether a functional dependency is redundant or uh, whether uh, an attribute is redundant or not. So here's the algorithm for calculating minimal covers. So the, the input is a set of functional dependencies and the output is the minimal cover uh, such that the minimal cover is equivalent to the original set of functional dependencies so the first one is we put every functional dependencies into canonical form which means that we we these all the functional dependencies now should only have one single attribute on the right hand side that's step one. The second step is we should eliminate the redundant attributes from the from the uh, from all the all the functional dependencies of the minimal cover, and then we eliminate the redundant functional dependencies from the minimal cover. And the first step we put. <laughs> the all the functional dependencies into a canonical form. So what we can do is we can apply one of the rules here to make sure that only a single attribute appears on the right hand side. So can you identify which rule is applied here to do this? To make sure that there's only one attribute on the right hand side. Which rule? Yes, yes, projectivity. We can use projectivity to separate the <laughs> so separate the rules into canonical form. So that's the step one. And to remove redundant attributes, what we can do is we can we can have a look at all the functional dependencies and for each functional dependency we we have a look at all of all of the attributes in that functional dependency and 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 we remove that attribute from that we remove that attribute from the functional dependency and with the new functional dependency we have created by removing the, the attribute we put it back to the to the to the minimal cover and use it to replace the original functional dependency and see if 
the new minimal cover is equivalent to the previous minimal cover. So if it is, if it is equivalent, it means that the appearance of that attribute doesn't affect the 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 equivalence of the of the minimal cover. So it it is redundant. So we can remove that. So this is the second algorithm here. So it's like we we check all the attributes by trying to remove it and see if it if it affects uh, the entire uh, the the entire set of functional dependencies or not. So that's that's the second step, and the last step is we can remove redundant functional dependencies, and it is relatively easier than removing redundant attributes. So we just need to go through all the go through all the functional dependencies, try to remove it from the minimal cover and see if the minimal cover st is still equivalent to the original site or not. If it is still equal, it means that removing that functional dependency doesn't affect uh, the overall equivalence. So it, it could be safely removed. So that's how we how we eliminate redundant functional dependencies. So let's have a look at an example here to see how these algorithms work. So in this example here, we are trying to cal compute the minimal cover for this f here, given the given the relation made up of a, b, and c. So because we could have the the closure of f is very very large. And uh, there could be m multiple uh, different functional, different sets of functional dependencies uh, that are doing the same thing here. So, what is the best one? The best one is the minimal cover. And let's try to calculate this minimal cover here. So, remember the first step is to convert our the functional dependency into the canonical form. So. That is to apply uh, that, that 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 is to apply projectivity, and what we can do is here this a to a determines b and c is not in canonical form. So what we can do is we can separate it into two rules: a determines b and a determines c. So that's the first step. The second step is to remove redundant attributes. So can you have a look at which attribute is redundant here in this in this set of functional dependent in all the functional dependence here? Which attribute is redundant? So if we take that attribute away from this from this functional dependency, it doesn't affect the overall equivalence. So which one is redundant here? Uh, let me give you a hint. For all these three functional dependencies, we can't remove we can't remove any attributes here because if we remove the attributes, all of them are single attributes. If we remo remove one of them, it will break the functional dependency here. So we can't we can't modify any one of the three here. What we can do is we can remove A or B in this case. But which one here is redundant? So actually, we can remove either one of them. So an either one of them is redundant, because if we remove B, let's say, it won't affect it won't affect the overall equivalence. If we remove A, it also won't affect the overall equivalence. So it's either A or B is redundant. 
and 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 if we are if we remove one of them it's very obvious that the functional dependency becomes redundant as well because if we remove b what we have is a determines c and it's actually equivalent to a determines c here and if we remove a determines uh, if we remove a it becomes b determines c and we already have one beta b determines c here so so that's why we can safely remove the last functional dependency here and 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 because of uh, uh and because of transitivity we can we can also safely remove a determines c here because if we remove even if we remove it the 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 closure of this the closure of this minimal cover is still the same as the closure of f because of transitivity so we can reversely use the inference rules to remove redundant functional dependence here so if a functional dependency could be inferred by other functional dependencies we can remove them so this is what we can do so so the result here is a determines b and b determines c so that is the minimal cover that could represent the functional dependencies in this example here and before we before we uh continue let's have a 10 minutes break and i forgot to bring snacks again today so sorry about that let's have a 10 minutes break
Uh, all right, uh, let's start uh, our second half today. So the second half, we will be learning normalization. That is to normalize the database design to remove redundancies from the design level. So normalization is a branch of relational theory providing design insights. And the goals of normalization are to be able to characterize the level of redundancy in a relational schema. So the first, uh, so we, we can have a level of redundancy using the, the concept of normalization here. And the second one is to provide mechanisms to transform schemas to remove redundancy. And if you have, if you have, if you have uh, went, uh, if you have gone through the the actual slides, you you will notice that we can you we can remove redundancies by separating big schemas into smaller ones. So, so now we learn how to systematically do this normalization. So normalization draws heavily on the theory of functional dependencies. So this is also why functional dependencies are important. And normalization algorithms reduce the level of redundancy in a schema. And, and it, it is done by decomposition, which is to break big schema into smaller ones. And and normalization theory defines six normal forms. So first, second, third, and boys code uh, uh, are BCNF, and fourth and fifth. So there are six normal forms. And there are six levels. So we say that a schema is in a normal form which tells us something about the level of the redundancies. So the higher the level is, the less the redundancies are. So the first normal form allows most redundancy, and the fifth normal form allows least redundancy. So for most practices, BCNF or the third NF are acceptable. So it's not it's neither too strict nor uh, too free. So in most cases, BCNF or third NF are used. Are used. So here are some uh, properties of the first four normal forms. So the first normal form uh, allows all attributes to have uh, atomic values and. Um, and every relation schema is actually in the first normal form. And the second normal form is to, to, to have the restriction that all non-key attributes should be fully dependent on keys. So this is the second normal form. And the third normal form, or and BC normal form, uh, have the restriction that no attributes depends on non-key attributes. So the second attributes requires all non-key attributes to be to be fully dependent on keys, but it, it also allows the, the attributes to be dependent on non-key values. But the third normal form and BC normal form uh, does not allow any non-key attributes to be dependent on non-key attributes. So, so this, this actually, it is kind of strict, as you can see here, and it actually helps to avoid most redundancies caused by uh, functional dependencies. So as we just mentioned in practice, uh, BCN 
normal form or the third normal form are the most important. And they are slightly different. So the BCNF eliminates all redundancies due to functional dependency. Actually, BCNF is a little bit more strict than the third normal form. And but BCNF may not preserve the original functional dependencies. And the third normal form, it eliminates most, but not all redundancies due to functional dependencies. However, it is guaranteed to preserve all functional dependencies. So that's the, 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 the minor differences between these two normal forms. And, uh, and let's have a closer look at their definitions. A relational schema R is in BC normal form with, with respect to a set of functional dependencies F if and only if for all functional dependencies uh, such as X determines Y in the closure of the functional dependency F. Either all the functional dependencies in this closure must must uh, uh, must uh, fulfill these two constraints. So either this this functional dependency is trivial, which means that the right hand side is the subset of the left hand side. So either it is trivial or the left hand side is a super key. So do you still remember the definition of a super key? A super key is a s the super set of a key. So a key is a set of attributes, and a super key is the super set of the attributes of the key. So that's the restriction here. So and that's that's the definition of BCNF on a relation on a relation schema and a db schema is in this bcnf if all the relationals all the relation schemas uh, are in bcnf so this is straightforward and we have two observations here based on the definition of bcnf the first one is any two attribute relation is in bcnf so so this is the first observation. The second one is any relation with key uh with with the key on the left hand side and other attributes on the right hand side is in BCNF. So this is these are the two observations here. And let's have a look at an example of how we could apply this definition of BCNF to determine if a schema is in the BC normal form. So the first example is in BCNF. So why? Why it is in BCNF? So let's assume the key is A here. So we can try to see if all the so the, the here's the restrictions of BCNF. So every every functional dependency here must must follow these two restrictions. So for let's assume A is a key. So for A determines B. It is obvious because A is a key, and for A to determine C and A to determines B D. They are the same, so they, they all fulfill the second restriction here. So that's why this this schema uh, is in BCNF. And the second schema here, the second example here, is not in BCNF. So do you know why it is not? So let's assume uh, so because because it violates 
it violates the two rules, no matter which key we use. So if we use A as the key here, if we use A as the key here, then D determines B does not have does not have a key on the left hand side. So none of them here is a trivial is a trivial functional dependency. So we should we just need to check whether the function the, the dependencies uh follows the, the restriction of X being a super key. So 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 unless unless we set the key to be A B C D, none of the none none of the uh, no actually none of the none of the uh, the left hand side attributes could be a super key. So A is not a super key. D is not a super key. B C of course is not a super key. So this is why no matter what we choose as the key here, we can't this this all the functional dependencies can't fulfill the second restriction here. And now let's have a closer look at the definition of the third normal form. So a relation schema is in third normal form with respect to a set of functional dependencies if and only if for all functional dependencies inside the closure of the of F, either the actual the functional dependency is trivial, so or the left hand side is a super key, or Y is a single attribute from a key. So as you can see, it has one more or here, which means that the third normal form is not as strict as the BC normal form. So that's why it's on a lower level. So a DB scheme, so that's the definition of uh, the whether uh, the, the relational schema uh, is in a uh, third normal form, and a DB schema is in the third normal form if all, if all the relation schemas are in the third normal form. So actually, the, the as you can see here, the, the it, it has an extra condition here. It means that it's slightly weaker than BCNF. And let's have a, and, and, and if we transform here, here are the properties that could be guaranteed by the third normal form. If we transform a schema into third normal form, we are guaranteed to have lossless join decomposition. So you don't need to worry about what is the definition of lossless join. We will have a look at an example later. And the second property to be guaranteed here is that the new schema preserves all the functional dependencies from the original schema. For BCNF, this may not hold. So the functional dependencies could be changed for BCNF. So however, however, we are not guaranteed for third NF, we are not guaranteed to remove update anomalies due to functional dependency based redundancies. So, so in practice, whether to use BCNF or third NF depends on the overall design considerations. So it depends on whether you want uh, less chance to have anomalies or, or you want to have a better performance. So this is, this is the design choices. So let's have a look at the, an example of BCNF. And uh, uh, sorry, sorry, this is third NF, third NF. So let's have a look at an example of the third NF. Sorry about this. Third. Sorry. 
So remember, here are the three conditions that the that the, the functional dependencies should fulfill. It should fulfill at least one of them. So this one, the first one, is is in the third normal form, the first relation. So why why it is in the third? Why it is why it it is in the third normal form? So let's have a look at it has only two functional dependencies here. So let's go through them one by one. So the first for the first functional dependency, B determines A C D E. So which one does it fulfill here? Yeah, the second one is is clear. So actually B is a super key. So that's why that's why the the first functional dependency passed the check. What about the second one? E determines B. So which one does it fulfill? Which condition does it fulfill? Here. Yeah, the third one is so th so that's that's why that's why this this schema is in the third normal form. However, this schema is not in the third normal form. So this time we have we still have A B C D E in the relation, and we still have two rules, two two functional dependencies. The first one is B determines A C D E. The second one is E determines D. And the key is still B here. So why this one doesn't is not in third normal form. Is because the first the first functional dependency here is not changed. So it's it's okay, we we don't need it, it it still uh follows the second restriction here. So B is a, a super key. But the second functional dependency does not cannot fulfill any one of the restrictions here. So E determines D is not a trivial one. It's not trivial because D is not a subset of E. And E is not a super key here. And and D is not a single attribute from a key. So that's why that's why that's why this this schema is not in the third normal form. So so basic it's it's kind of straightforward for you to determine if a schema uh, follows uh, falls into a normal form or not because you can you can just check all the go through all the functional dependencies and check one by one whether the functional dependencies uh, can fulfill any one of the restrictions so that's how you check if a schema is in a normal form or not and now we have learned now that we have learned uh the definition of normal forms and remember our final goal is to do normalization is to re remove redundancies and and let's have a look at how we can do this so normalization aims to put a schema into a normal form by ensuring that all the relations in the schema are in that target normal form so this is normally how uh, how this uh, normalization works. So first, we d we need to choose the target uh, the target normal form, and we need to decide okay this whether this uh, target normal form is acceptable for our design or not, and then we check whether 
each one of the schema in the database is in that target normal form. And if if a relation is not in that target normal form, we partition that relation or that schema into sub relations or smaller tables where each one of them is closer to the target normal form. And we repeat this uh, partitioning process until all relations in the DB schema are in the target normal form. So as you can see here, the key, the key step is to partition the big schemas into smaller ones. So this is called relation decomposition. And it is the standard transformation technique to remove redundancy. So we are what we are doing here is essentially decompo decomposing a relation R into relations S and T. And we com we accomplish uh, decomposition by selecting subsets of attributes and put them into and form new relations based on the selected subsets of attributes. So the properties here are the the separated two the two separated relation should contain all the attributes of R of the original big schema. And they should they they should not they should have overlapping because we need to hold the relation between them between the two subsets and later on we will see why we we need to hold the rela relation why they should have overlaps and the third one is this is uh, the 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 symbol for join so the third one is when we join the two sub two new relations they should they should give us the original table so this is also important and we may require several decompositions to achieve an acceptable normal form and we have some algorithms to tell us how to choose uh, these uh, new tables so Let's use an example here to demonstrate what are the key steps and what are the what's the thinking process. So let's consider the following relation for bank loans, and it this schema has all of the update anomalies we have discussed in our last lecture. So the all kinds of anomalies appears in this table. So let's try to separate this big schema into smaller ones so the following decomposition is actually not useful if we separate the the this schema into two tables let's say we have a we separate it into branch or customer loan and branch contains branch name branch city assets Customer customer loan contains customer name, loan number, and amount. So why this decomposition is not helpful? Remember in our previous slides, these are the properties that it should fulfill. So they they contain all the attributes from R, but why are they not useful here? Why is not helpful here? Actually, they have no overlaps. Yes, yes, they have no overlaps. But why overlapping is important here? It's because we will lose inform we will lose some information if there's no overlap between the two relations here. So, if we separate the table like this, we will lose the information of uh, the linkage between the customer loan and the branch so in this case we don't know which branch does this loan belongs to 
So we can't, we must have overlaps between the two new relations. And in order to solve this problem, what we can do is we can put, cust uh, assume every customer has a unique name. So we can put customer name as a foreign key here in this branch customer table. So this, this time the branch customer table contains branch name, branch city, assets, customer name, and the customer loan table is unchanged. So it contains customer name, loan number, and amount. So now this is, if we separate the table according to this new schema design, it will look like this. However, however, this one is still not ideal. It doesn't follow any normal form. It doesn't fall into any normal form. Uh, it doesn't fa fall into BC normal form or third normal form. Let's see why. So remember we have three properties. All the attributes must appear in either one of the, uh, in, in, in the union of the two new tables that's already fulfilled. And they should have overlapping, and that's al already fulfilled. But let's try to join the new tables together and see if we can get the original data back. So if we join the two new tables together according to customer name, what we will get is, because let's say for drones, we can, on the left hand side we have downtown, Brooklyn drones, and on the right hand side, we have two drones. So, so for downtown Brooklyn, we have two loan, two entries here on the right hand side. It's the same for for the second uh, horse Nike branch here. So we we will have two duplicate loan numbers here for when we join the table according to customer names. And remember in the original, in the original table, L, L17, uh, L17 only belongs to downtown, to Brooklyn, and L93 only belongs to house Nike for drones. So if we separate the table like this and we join them together, we cannot, we cannot get our original table back. So this, this separation is still not valid. So this is clearly n not a successful decomposition. And the fact we end up with s extra tuples was because of we are losing some critical connection information during the decomposition. We, are, we have lost some information. And this decomposition is called a lossy decomposition. So that's why we cannot get our original table back when we do the drawing. And in a good decomposition, we should be able to reconstruct the original relation exactly. So it means that if R is decomposed into S and T, then S, S join T should give us R back. And such a decomposition is called a lossless drawing decomposition. So this is the concept of lossless drawing decomposition. And now let's see how can we, how can we really do this decomposition or normalization for the BCNF or third NF. So for BCNF, this is a pseudocode of the algorithm for uh, the normalization process. So the inputs are the schema and the set of functional dependencies. And the output is a set of smaller schema, s uh, smaller schemas in BCNF. So what we can do is we can go through the we can go through all the 
uh, we can go through the table and find we can f uh, for all the schemas we already have we go through the all the functional dependencies in that schema and see if that functional dependency violates BCNF. If so, we will separate that table and put it back into our s our set of schemas. And we will do this until there's until all the functional dependencies in all the smaller schemas can, uh, can does not violate the normal form the restrictions so the la uh, the last step here in in this algorithm actually means we can make a we can make a table out of the the uh, the, the functional dependency that violates bcnf and drop the drop the r the right hand side attributes from the original table so why don't we dro drop the left hand side? Because we only draw in we only drop the left hand side because we need to keep the left hand side in the original table to make sure that there's overlap between the two new tables. Overlapping is important to keep the connections. So that's why we only drop the right hand side. And with this, of course, this choose any process. We we can we can choose it in any order. So the ordering doesn't matter here. Let's have a look at an example of how we can do, how we can apply this algorithm step by step. So this is, uh, so so we are reusing the bank loans schema. So in this case, we we we, we rename the we we rename the the attributes to simplify the notations here. So we use B to represent branch number, branch name, C to represent branch city, A to represent assets, N to represent customer name, L to represent loan number, and M to represent amounts. So remember BCNF has the following restrictions here on the on the left hand side of the slides on the right hand side of the slides so what we have now is the relation is bc a n l m and the functional name uh, the functional dependencies are the branch name can determine both branch city and assets and the loan number determines both the amount and customer name. And the key of this original schema is B and L, because B and L can B and L can determine all the all the attributes inside this table, inside this original table. However, this table is not in BCNF because because B determines C and A. Uh, of course, both of the uh, functional dependencies are not trivial, so it's clear. So so we, we, we need to ensure that the, the left-hand side uh, attribute should be a super key, but of obviously uh, the key is BL, and B is not a super key. So this first functional dependency violates BCNF here. So let's try to solve it. So what we can do is we can separate we can separate R into S and T into S and T according to the functional dependency violating BCNF. And what we do is we put, we collect the attributes involved in the functional dependency that violates the uh, violates BCNF into one table, and drop the right hand side from the original table. So, so for the functional dependency that violates the 
that for the functional dependency that violates BCNF, we can have the table B, C, and A as the first table. And we remove the right-hand side from the original table. This will give us the second one, B, N, L, M. And the functional dependency uh, the functional dependency of table S is B determines C and A. The functional dependency for uh, table T is L determines N and M. And the key for the new table here for S is B. The key for T is still B and L. So now does anyone, does, uh, now should we stop this algorithm here? So does it, does all the, uh, does any, so does every schema here, uh, is every schema here in BCNF? So is there any violations here for what we already have S and T? So none of the functional dependencies are trivial, right? So do they follow the second restriction here? So actually, let's try to Let's try to check whether they are uh, whether they they follow the functional dep uh, whether they follow the restrictions of BCNF one by one. So, for sorry, for table S for table S, the functional dependency here is B determines C and A, and the key is B, and it is not trivial. This functional dependency is not trivial, and but 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 B is a super key here for table S. So table S actually is in the BC normal form now. So we don't need to worry about table S. But for table T, the new table, table T here. So the the, the functional dependency is L determines N and M. And it is not trivial, of course. But it doesn't it doesn't fulfill the second restriction as well. L is not a super key. The super key should be B and L. So, so this one for this table for we we, s we still need to decompose table T in this case. So as you can see, this this is still not fulfilled. The the res all the restrictions. So what we can do is we can do something similar of how we decompose R. And can you come up with the decomposition here? So what is the first table we should have here? The first table, the first table we should have should contain all the attributes of the functional dependency that violates BCNF. So what is the first table here? Yes, L and M. And what about the second table here? Yes, B and L. Yes. This, uh, the first table is obtained by collecting all the attributes in the functional dependency that violates BCNF. So since uh, the functional dependency that violates the BC BCNF here is L determines N and M. So it's quite obvious that the, ta the first table should contain L, N, and M. And the second one is we remove the right-hand side from the original table. So this time the right-hand side is N and M. The original table is table T. So we remove N and M from table T and the and what we will have is B and L. So in this case, the functional dependency for 
table uh, now we have table u and v assume we have table u and v and for table u the functional dependency is l determines n and m is is inherited from um, the, the the table t and but this time the key is only l and it can fulfill the second condition here so it is in bcnf table u is in bcnf and for table v the there's no functional dependencies in this table and the key is uh, b and l but uh, since there's no functional dependencies here in this table it doesn't violate uh, the the, the bcnf so that's why it is also in bcnf so now all the tables are in bcnf so in the end we will have s u and v and this all the three schema all the three schemas now are in bcnf and we have finished the normalization so this is how we do bcnf and this is the algorithm of of third nf and it looks a bit more complex than uh, than bcnf but uh, the, the idea is a bit different from from doing bcnf and the, and how we construct uh, the the third nf how we do third nf normalization requires us to get a minimal cover of a reduced minimal cover of the original uh, function dependencies so a minimal cover is the smallest complete set of function dependencies and a reduced minimal cover is still the smallest smallest complete set but it's not in the canonical form so we are reducing the number of we are reducing the number of uh, functional dependencies in this minimal cover so in canonical form all the right hand side uh, of the functional dependencies should be a single attribute uh, but in this case a reduced minimal cover we are trying to merge them together so that's the reduced minimal form and let's have a look at an example of how we could use this algorithm here so you you don't need to worry about the details and you just need to you just need to you just need to understand how this example works and you will appreciate or you will understand w the the algorithm so so let's consider the bank loan schema again and uh, and this time it's still uh, the, the the relation is still b c a n l and m and uh, the functional dependencies are b determines c and a l determines m and n and the key is still made up of b and l and this time we try to compute the minimal cover first of the functional dependency and the minimal cover in the canonical form is like this so it's quite obvious we just apply the uh, we, we, we can just do the the first step and and it is already uh, a minimal cover we don't need to remove redundant attributes or redundant uh, functional dependencies here so in the end we have p determines c b, b, b determines a l determines m l determines n and we try to get the reduced minimal cover and the reduced minimal cover is to combine the to combine the the right hand side uh, ac ac to combine the uh, the functional dependencies according to the same left hand side attributes so in this case in this case in this case it's a coincidence that the reduced minimal cover is f 
again. So we, this is the reduced minimal cover. And what we do in our next step is we convert, we convert every, uh, we collect, we collect the attributes from every functional dependencies in the reduced minimal cover and make them schemas. So we, so now we have the first schema S as B, C, and A from based on this first functional dependency. And the second schema we have here is T, and it is based on the based on the second functional dependency here. But this is not the stop, because in the because in the in the in in the uh, in the algorithm, if no schema contains uh, so this this step is to put array to put array functional dependency in the minimal reduced minimal cover into a new table. So this is the first one, and the second one is if no schema contains a key for the original table, we make we make the candidate key any candidate key of the original table into a separate table. So as you can see here, we just finished the first uh, the, the first step. So we are converting all the all the functional dependencies from the reduced minimal cover into a separate relation. But the original the key of the original relation is that doesn't appear in any one of the new schemas. So we add a new table containing the key of the original table. And this will give us S, T, and U. S is B, C, and A. T is L and M. U is B and L. And in this case, it's a coincidence again. So the decomposition here is the same as B, C, and F. So this will give us uh, how it, uh, the, uh, uh, the schemas in third and F. So to achieve a good database design, uh, what we can do is now we have learned the most commonly used n normal normal forms and how can we use a systematic approach to do the normalization to 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 make sure the to put the tables into normal forms and and to achieve a good database design we should identify attributes entities relations into ER a good ER design, and we can map the ER design to relation relational schema, and that's what we have already learned in the first few lectures. And of course, we should also identify constraints. And and the last step is we should apply a normalization algorithm to produce normalized schema to reduce the redundancies and but, but of course this is not the end sometimes remember remember redundancy is not al always bad sometimes it's good for performance we can avoid joining tables if we have certain level of redundancies so in actual practice sometimes we may need to denormalize to allow some redundancies for 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 performance, so it's like a trade-off. So if we want less anomalies, we should apply uh, more strict uh, normalizations. But but th they may have they may harm the performance of the database. So that's the end of today's lecture. And thank you for coming. <coughs>